All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Kristen Anton. I'm the online community builder for the New Tactics and Human Rights Project at the Center for Victims of Torture. And this Google Hangout is meant to complement our New Tactics online discussion that we're having this week on working safely and effectively with documentation tools. And this discussion is being hosted in partnership with Herodox and Benetech. And this conversation topic is part of a series on seeking justice. So when we talk about human rights documentation, we're talking about the documentation of human rights violations for the purpose of seeking justice. So in today's Hangout, we're going to be discussing how to select the right approach to human rights documentation. So we will share some information on the different tools that are available to human rights defenders, and we'll talk about some of the criteria that you should keep in mind when selecting the right approach. And I wanted to let everybody know that this Hangout will be broadcast live right now, and it's going to be recorded, and I will be posting the recording to the discussion on the New Tactics website. So the first thing I'm going to ask everybody is to introduce yourselves. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six people on the call. I'm just going to start from the right and go to the left. So Travis, could you please introduce yourself to the group? Hi, my name is Travis. Is my microphone working correctly? Yeah, we can hear you great. OK, perfect. Uh, right, so my name is Travis, uh, and I work at the Bahrain Center for Human Rights. Um, we are a small documentation center, and we focus exclusively on uh, human rights uh, issues in Bahrain. I'm based in Copenhagen. We've got a very small little office here. And most of our team is on the ground. Great. Thank you. I'm mm -hmm. glad you can make it to this hangout. Thanks. Jean Vier, could you please introduce yourself? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, my name is Jean Vier. Uh, it's uh, just a uh, Kenyawandan French name. I'm a protection associate at the Eastern Horn of Africa Human Rights Defenders Project here in Kampala. I'm also a PhD student, and as part of my PhD studies, uh, I lecture uh, uh, digital security and uh, digital documentation, mainly my specializations in matters. Uh, after a discussion with my supervisors and uh, other lecturers, we saw fit to only tackle matters, but we also mentioned some other tools like OpenFC, so here we go. Thank you. Great. And Friedhelm, can you please introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Friedhelm. I work for an organization called Heredox, based in Switzerland. And one of the main topics we're working on is human rights documentation. And as uh, Jean-Vier already um, said, we also develop a tool that is used for that. It's called OpenFSIS. And it's actually uh, turning 25 this year. Um, so we've been doing this for a while. <laughs> Great. Thanks. And next is Francis. Francis, could you please introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Frances. Um, I am interning with Kristen um, this summer, and I'm a student at Clark University um, getting my master's in international development and social change. Thanks. And Frances will actually be writing the summary of this discussion, and we'll be sharing that on the conversation page. Dimitri, could you please introduce yourself? Yes. Hi. Uh, my name is Dimitri Vitaliev. I run an organization called Equality. Uh, we concentrate on creating digital security solutions for members of civil society. Um, we do also quite a lot of work in digital security and auditing. Um, but we also do develop, like Curidox, uh, tools for human rights documentation management, including rights case and corroborator. Great. Thanks, Dimitri. Glad you can be on this call, because this is an important one for you to um, share your tools in. Likewise, and, yes. and David, could you please introduce yourself? Hi, I'm David Bookwinder. I'm glad to be on this call. I tried to get on on Monday and had some audio problems, so I'm glad this is working. Um, I, I'm a consultant. I work on human rights in Africa. i um, been spent a bunch of years at Human Rights Watch working on Chad and Sudan, Central African Republic. Um, more recently, I've been working in training, human rights training, and down in South Africa, Southern Africa, in Botswana. We've been running a Training Institute, um, but I keep my hand in uh, research, research and documentation, doing work on child soldiers um, in Central Africa for Child Soldiers International. Great. Okay. Thanks. I'm glad you can join us. Me too. 
Okay, everybody. So um, this hangout is meant to last for about 30 minutes, but if we go over, that's fine with me. And if you have to leave, just go ahead and, and take off. Um, I'm just going to very briefly summarize what we've already talked about up until this point and some of the points that have been made in the online discussion forum. So Monday's Hangout was on why security is important to human rights documentation. And I think we all agree that protecting uh, human rights data isn't just for the sake of protecting data. It's because we're protecting the populations and communities from which where the data is coming from. So it's important to protect the data for the sake of those populations. Tuesday's Hangout we talked about where and when documentation happens and how we can make it more secure. And a lot of interesting and important points were raised here as well. Um, we discussed the fact that there's a changing reality around human rights documentation and that the field is complex and diverse and that more people and professions are engaging in documentation. Um, and it's not just lawyers and activists anymore. It's also journalists and citizen journalists and. Um, other different human rights groups working on many different issues. And this diversity and complexity poses new challenges in terms of security and human rights documentation. Many documentarians, and I realize that's not really a word, but I'm going to use it anyway. Many documentarians aren't part of formal organizations, and some don't even realize that they're documenting human rights violations. And um, this poses some challenges, and we need to explore how we can ensure that these people are acting responsibly with the data that they're collecting so that they're not putting communities at risk. And this question has been posed a few times in the online discussion forum. And Molly, during the last uh, Google Hangout, posed a question of, should we be thinking about this challenge or problem as one of human rights documentation, or is it a problem of the technology? And that's being discussed more on the discussion forum as well. Um, Daniel mentioned that all human rights practitioners can benefit from learning how to work more securely online in general, and that this will impact security of human rights documentation. Another point that was highlighted in the Hangout and in the discussion forum is the importance of organizational policies around data security and also improving and building organizational culture that values this secure data security. And then we also touched on the future of human rights documentation and that it might not be happening by people at some point. It might just be machines and that this pose, poses some challenges to the ethical requirements to get informed consent from those whose information is being collected. So th those are some of the topics we've already touched on, and I hope that we continue to explore those in the discussion on our New Tactics website. And today we're going to be talking about how to select the right approach to human rights documentation. So we've been kind of in maybe the more theoretical side of this discussion so far, and now I think we're bringing it um, closer to the ground, more concrete um, ideas and stories and lessons um, and tools that will be shared in this, this discussion topic. So under this topic of how to select the right approach, we are talking about the development of the tools. Uh, the tools themselves that have been created for human rights practitioners, other tools that are not necessarily specifically for human rights practitioners but are being used by them, and then also the, what are the criteria for selecting the right tools and the right approach? What do you need to keep in mind when you're making these decisions? Um, some things that have already been, much of this actually has already started to be discussed on the New Tactics site. So regarding the development of the tools, um, some of the thoughts already shared is that the technologists need to really understand the actual needs of the practitioners on the ground, and also that there's different types of documentarians. Um, and Carolina actually just joined the call, and she mentioned this on the last Google Hangout, that um, there are different purposes for the collection of data. Sometimes you need the data to be protected at all times. Maybe it's internal data, as Daniel also mentioned. But sometimes it's being collected for the purpose of justice, and that means that the data is not always going to be private. It's meant to be shared and analyzed. 
So these are a couple of the things to keep in mind as you're developing tools, if you're a technologist. Um, and that's, a, that's where I'll stop with summarizing everything that's been shared. Um, I'm going to ask Carolina to introduce herself, and then we'll start talking about what tools currently exist for human rights practitioners. So Carolina, could you please introduce yourself? Oh, Carolina, I think you're muted. Sorry. In Great. A... Okay. I can hear you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Carolina. I am from Guatemala. I am a sociologist here, and I am a researcher in the quantitative study uh, using sample math uh, with HRDAC in the United States. Uh, trying to ask some questions about the archive. I work in, in the National Police Archive in Guatemala. Great. Thanks, Carolina. Glad you could join us. Um, okay, so Jean Vier actually posted a very great comprehensive comment in our discussion about some of the tools that exist currently for human rights documentation. Those tools include MARTIS, OpenEvSys, Corab, uh, although, um, OK, so Dimitri has a few that aren't included in the list. Um, and we want to hear more about those tools, the Corroborator and Rights Case. And then Herodox is also developing CaseBox. So why don't we start with um, Friedhelm? Could you talk a little bit about OpenEvSys and potentially CaseBox and any other thoughts you have on uh, choosing the right approach to documentation? Sure. Um, I think choosing the right approach to human rights documentation is, is very context specific on the documentation that you want or need to do. So there's um, there's rarely one tool that will fit exactly your purpose from the start. So the question is is rather what what you want to do. What what are your goals? What are your needs? And what are your capacity? And to balance these, and then look what is the, the closest approximation from, from what's out there, and see to what extent it can be customized, and if that's something that works for you. Um, that is why I think it's very valuable to have very different tools within the community um, that allow people to choose from to see, um, to already also get ideas on, on what is useful. So. Um, we already talked a bit about OpenEFSIS. So OpenEFSIS is um, an online-based uh, database that um, organizations or groups or networks would use to document violations. It's built on um, a methodology called events methodology that has been developed um, over the course of almost 10 years um, in consultations, including many organizations. So it has a very thorough system of documentation built in but it, this can be customized according to the needs of, um, of a particular organization. But, um, what I think is, is very interesting about OpenEFSIS is that it allows relatively easy um, collaboration uh, for people who are not in the same location on documentation and also has quite powerful analysis put into the system. So it doesn't require you to export the information than to do a statistic analysis. You can do a lot of this already in OpenSys, or you can visualize it on the map. Um, Casebox, on the other hand, was um, a tool that we have started developing quite recently. And it was built for a different purpose in the end, which was uh, litigation management, so case management, more strictly speaking. But uh, Casebox is an incredibly flexible tool, and it's not built with any particular methodology in mind. So I think for organizations who have a special need that isn't covered yet by one of the tools with a more rigid methodology in mind, this could be something um, very interesting to build upon. It also has some analysis features built in, and it's, it's also built with um, uh, location, non-specific collaboration in mind, but um, it comes with less baggage, but it also requires more thinking on how to make it work for, for a particular context. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, Dimitri, could I ask you to talk a bit about the tools that your organization has built? Yeah, sure. Gladly. Um, so usually we build specifically on the demands of a particular client or an organization and then we keep the source open um, and we release uh, the toolkit to the rest of the world. Um, so Rights Case specifically is uh, very easy to use, very graphical. Um, you know, it's built around Drupal. 
um, and it's meant for organizations who are pursuing kind of long-term human rights investigations. Um, cases are created, people and events associated with those cases uh, are plotted. Originally it was um, developed for a group of organizations in Zimbabwe hoping to document uh, violations of the Mugabe regime, but since then it's been used in many different instances as well. Um, the other tool which we recently released called Corroborator. Um, by the way, you can find all of these on our website, including the demos to them. I'll post a link in a second. Um, is a different approach to documenting more what I would call metadata related to human rights documentation. The client in this particular case was hoping to collate, well, they're still doing this, um, ongoing violations coming out of Syria, um, whereby you have many different groups on the ground um, documenting violations, possibly with different motivation, with different bias, and in a different way. So their hope was to be able to plot all of these different pieces of information about a particular incident and then to be able to corroborate what had actually happened. So this is the point of corroborated to allow the data analysts to traverse hundreds of thousands of millions of records quite quickly, rating different sources of information as to their reliability and then trying to build a coherent picture of what actually happened on the ground. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Very helpful. Um, well, I'd love to hear about Martis. Nobody from Benetech is on this Hangout, but I'm sure Jean Vier could speak to it, or if somebody else would like to talk about Martis. Um, yeah, Martis is uh, um, a software, an open source software that they use to uh, document um, human rights violations and abuses. And uh, when I'm lecturing, it's like I don't we normally differentiate abuses and uh, and, and uh, violations. Violations are are committed by the government and those abuses by individual non-government actors. So uh, it documents and it, uh, it also serves a backup in the remote uh, uh, servers uh, which are uh, one in Vancouver, Canada, another one in, uh, in Budapest, Hungary. Um, OpenFC is open, uh, no, no, I mean, I'm sorry, Matters is an open software. It gives you the chance to customize uh, the uh, uh, software to put to your context. It means that you will be able to know if you are like, for example, a journalist, you can try to customize the uh, software, include the item that you want it to contain. What they have done is they have released a standardized uh, uh, format, which is not really complicated, and uh, people uh, can try to code, uh, to code and add more. For example, when I was in Mali training uh, human rights defenders uh, in Mali, I taught them how to customize. Then the last two days, they were even like my, 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 my teachers. They will say, you did this one, and we don't want this one to be like this. So for them, it is really easy. And also the good thing with Matters, it, it, it has incorporated um, uh, what you call Tor Browser, which is a software tool, a security tool to anonymize uh, the user. Also, it uses encryption, which is quite different from uh, from open LCs. and also it has another item of uh, configuration of like sharing information easily if for example you are like in usa or uh, i'm in africa like i'm your boss it means that we can you can configure me as uh, your uh, your boss then any information that you send uh you 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 document using matters is immediately sent to uh, the uh, server either in Vancouver or Budapest, depending on the uh, uh, the, the server you chose. You chose. Then I will be able to uh, retrieve that information. 
So this is really uh, economical and people have been using it, though it has not really been popularized as it should. That's why we uh, decide at Makere University that we should incorporate that in the curriculum and see how the students will be equipped with such knowledge and be able also to, uh, to customize to their uh, respective regions and organizations. Thank you. That was a great explanation. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to unmute Carolina and I'm going to ask you all if there are any other tools that uh, you feel are particularly useful for human rights documentation, um, any other tools that have been built for human rights documentation, or other tools that haven't been built for it but are being used? Um, what other tools can we add to this list at this point? Freedom started to document, I believe, a few of these tools. I think it, it was an interesting list. We tried to make a, a table before this oh, conversation, right. but we didn't have time, unfortunately. Um, but we did start to document them. I don't know, Freedom, do you want to walk, walk through them quickly? Yes, I can do this. Uh, let me just open the, the document that you, that you mentioned. Um, not all of them are used for, for documentation, though. Um, some to some extent. It depends a bit on sort of how you how you conceptualize documentation and what you include in that. So if you, for example, care more about providing um, services to victims, which is, uh, uh, is also a very important aspect of it, it might also be useful to um, use something like a CRM software um, to do this. So um, there's obviously organizations who have been doing this. And uh, while I'm still trying to find the list, you, you caught me a bit off hook, Dimitri. Um, <laughs> Sorry, mate. I, I can go through them as well. Uh, yeah. I can go through the ones I know, anyway. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because basically there are content management tools uh, which can be used for human rights documentation. So I guess this leads to the kind of central topic of this conversation as well. How do you choose tools that don't have to be specifically created for documenting human rights, as Friedhelm mentioned, um, but they can be applicable as such? Um, CVCRM is an interesting uh, point in case. Well, this is basically a content, a, a record management system for NGOs where you can create lots of user reports, lots of campaigns, um, but then you can also, there is a, a case function in there as well. Um, it's a free and open source initiative. Um, then obviously on the other hand you have the other approach to mapping human rights violations and obviously the Shahidi here um, is quite popular in the field. So here again we are talking about metadata and specifically plotting, geographically plotting metadata um, to create a, a particular campaign or, or a coordination of information. Um, the, there is of course Salesforce, uh, also quite a very popular commercial tool. Um, actually I've never played with Salesforce to be able to describe it properly. Uh, but as far as I understand, it has multiple functionalities in, in all sorts of directions. Mm -hmm. um, have you caught up yet, Freedom? Um, yeah, so I think we, we, we still haven't really talked about uh, the most commonly used one, which is a spreadsheet. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so the simple spreadsheet will... Um, will be used by many organizations and if um, they're using one computer or they have a smart way of sharing the spreadsheet, this can be totally adequate um, because the spreadsheet is is very portable and it can be used and as um, Carolina also described for Martis, can, data can then be exported to, to be further analyzed with data analysis software but you can also do some pivoting already. So depending on what you want to document and how many cases you have, so because if you have hundreds of cases it gets a bit messy, a spreadsheet might be a um, perfectly adequate um, tool for, uh, for documentation. And it's one that everyone understands, which uh, doing documentation is, is very valuable. Yeah. That is my um, 
I just wanted to mention that I hope that uh, something that comes out of this uh, discussion is that potentially we could create a table like you two are mentioning. Um, I think that would be incredibly useful. Sure. Um, I think uh, we will go through it once more. Maybe you also have some ideas, and we're, uh, we're happy to share it. Um, we're thinking about this also in terms of a, of a walkthrough, um, in terms of if you wanted to set up a database-driven or a documentation project, what kind of steps to look at um, as brief as possible. So if anyone's interested in um, collaborating on this, I think uh, we're, we're happy to, to share what we have right now. I can jump in with a few tools that we've used. Yeah, great. Go ahead, um, Travis. None of them, um, they weren't really uh, designed for human rights documentation. But, um, the team we have on the ground is very mobile, um, all over Bahrain. And then we have our office here in Copenhagen. Um, so what they do is they go out and they document uh, taking, and it's usually with their phones, with their telephones. Um, so they're taking photographs, and they're interviewing people, and then they'll communicate that back to us. And sometimes they'll use uh, SureSpot uh, for communications. And but we've used WhatsApp before, but we're trying to transition away from that. Um, or Tech Secure, or um, different types of mobile apps um, to, to share photographs and, and information to interview with us um, directly without having to run around with a, a computer. Because we can't actually all have an office there either. So it's, it's made for mobile documentation. Uh, Travis, so all of that information gets sent to one person or one computer or one location, and then it's collected in another kind of system. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we've got a team that that, um, that goes out, and then everything is collected here in the Copenhagen office. Um, okay. We'll use like spreadsheets, like uh, like Kim was saying about you know, we use Google Docs or different spreadsheets like that. Um, obviously, they're not the most secure or ideal methods, but but there's something that everyone's familiar with and something that would uh, for right now. Um, so that's what we've been using, but we're trying to transition out to, to more secure methods. But a, a lot of the other teams in Bahrain, um, we're not the only one, obviously. Um, they all also, everything's pretty much mobile telephone based. Okay. Um, um, David, do you have anything to add to the tools or any thoughts on... Um, how, the process of selecting the right tool or any particular challenges that are coming up now in this field? You know, I'm really from the old school of pen and paper, sometimes a tape recorder, so, you know, um, I'm here to learn. Okay, great. Carolina, anything to add to this? Uh, probably a little more about Marcus. Mm -hmm. um, I think the first thing is what kind of information we want to, to collect. Mm -hmm. And in, in that way, you have to choose uh, what is the best um, tool do you have. And in our case, uh, differently to the other experience, we use the document as testimony in the same way to, to, to take the information. And that means we need to to collect information, not only the document, it means I need to attach the image to the original document, and like like I put in the in my comment, Mark just give me that possibility to create templates, uh, like by sections. Uh, each section is one question in, in bigger. And I attach the image, and this information go to the remote server, and then is analyzed, and and have different levels to security in the in the way, and probably have to be can be better about time. Time you you take to export the information. Uh, here in Guatemala, we take like days. Um, updating the information and then the same time to, to down information mm -hmm. for for read in, in other platforms are like R or Stata. So um, I, I 
for us, marches work, but have he, have it complicated about time. You have to be sure marches is the best way. Uh, but the first thing you have to be clear is what kind of information you, you want to collect. That is all. Um, Thank what I could add uh, on what uh, uh, Carolina said is that uh, before, like, Mattis has a format which, uh, which is, like, simple. But if you want to add something, uh, like, for example, you have to look at your intake form. If, for example, you're working on, um, let me say, uh, gender-based uh, victims, so you have to know that the names of the victim and also the location where, who is the author, like the perpetrator of that violence and everything. If you have just the intake form, which is the concept, then you can uh, go to option, then customize, then you can just quote. So uh, customization uh, starts from the concept that you have. Then after getting the concept, then you can try to insert your concept uh, uh, in matters. It is like, uh, you are entering your intake form into into matters. Yes. Great. But it's it's not it's not really difficult to do because um, uh, I even carry out some online um, online uh, uh, training. Sometimes my my former trainees may have some difficulties. Then I can send 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 them some notes and everything, and I explain. It's not really difficult. It's a matter of uh, mastering the first uh, model customization. Uh, then after you will just try to think through how you would uh, you would want it to be. If, for example, you want to have a box which is tickable, and also, uh, and if you want to have like let me say uh, a space where you're going to be typing some information, like let me say uh, uh, five paragraphs or ten paragraphs, uh, where you will have a, scroll, a, scroll, a scrollable uh, bar and everything, it's not really difficult uh, to customize. It's easy. Yes. Okay. Okay, yeah. well, thank you all for talking about these tools that are available. And I propose that we continue that discussion on the New Tactics Forum. Uh, we want to hear more about your experiences actually using the tool. I think that's very um, useful, uh, Carolina and jean -Vier, that we learn about how, it, how it's being used by you on the ground and um, whether there are any challenges that you guys are facing. Mm -hmm. um, before we go, I just wanted to find out if there are any topics, questions, or challenges that you all really want to have addressed in the New Tactics Online Discussion Forum. Uh, Jean Vier posted a great list of criteria that should be considered in when you're selecting your documentation tool. So he included things like you need to consider accessibility, availability, affordability, user friendliness, security, free dis distribution and redistribution, transparency, perpetuity, intro, parability, customizability, yes. flexibility, secure and free backup opportunity, accommodating, efficient information sharing, and multi purpose. So I want to, you all, if there's something that's really any topics really burning um, for you in this field of selecting the right documentation tool? Or any new trends, or what do you think? OK. Well, I think the, the piece that Travis has talked about with the mobile phone applications, I think that's going to be an important piece to discuss in the forum, because that's obviously something that's new. And Martis, I know, is building a uh, phone application. It has already launched it. Okay. For Android phones.
Is there anything that you are really hoping to get out of this discussion around the tools that exist and how to select the right tool? Um, I guess, I guess, like I said before, the the mobile application. Um, which one of these might be best suited for um, combining the needs of uh, both the stationary office and a mobile team? You know, and how can those two things uh, work together? Right. Uh, securely, securely, because that's one of the yeah. biggest things right now. Is the tools we are using are not, are not, um, we can't feel comfortable with them. Yeah. So, so those two things, and also longevity. Um, to make sure that we that we build a platform um, that is going to, to be sustainable for 10, 15 years at least. Yeah. So we don't just jump onto like a, a trend in documentation and then two or three years later we're, we've got a, all of our data in a format that isn't exactly uh, very, very usable for a situation. Yeah, so very important. Yeah. Okay, well, I guess I propose that we just move this discussion to the New Tactics website. Um, are there any other last questions or thoughts or ideas that come up for you before we end? Something that popped into my mind uh, mm -hmm. as we were discussing the various different tools and something which is very prevalent in the open data and open government movements um, are open documentation standards and open data standards. Uh, it seems, at least in my experience, that when a group chooses or when a group is trained in a particular tool, then they stick to this tool for the remainder of the project, whether it is the correct tool or not correct tool, uh, because the possibility to migrate to a different tool is incredibly complex. I think uh, organizations such as ours, you know, developing these tools on kind of public funds should mm -hmm. begin to consider, you know, common data formats and common data standards so that migration between these various projects mm -hmm. for an organization um, should, you know, it, it, it should be an option that they have. That's a great point. Mm -hmm. It opens up a possibility of collaboration among these different um, developers and organizations and, I mean, Maybe it's good to use Martis one year, but then you want to be able to also utilize OpenFSYS for a different piece of the project, and how can they all talk to each other? Exactly. I guess that's another project. Um. <laughs> Go ahead, Janvier. Yes, uh, I think data migration is very important. I know that we, we Neil and, and I uh, have tried to work on how to migrate the data from spreadsheet into uh, open LCS. It's, uh, it's really great, but uh, still it's a bit complicated. If they can simplify the methods of how to do that, that would be really uh, cool. All right, there you go, Friedhelm. <laughs> yeah, let's uh, let's talk about uh, maybe your experience um, afterwards and see uh, to what extent this this could be improved. Um, where your pain points were. Okay, great. This has been so helpful. Um, I think I'm going to just go ahead and wrap up. It's 40 minutes after the hour. Uh, thank you all so much for participating in this. We're going to have another hang out tomorrow at the same time where we'll be talking about collaborative documentation and information sharing and so this kind of crosses all the different platforms that we're discussing today um, and talking about how we can do that more effectively and more securely so I hope you can join us for that Google Hangout as well please go to the newtactics.org website to continue this conversation by adding your comments to the discussion all right, thanks everybody for joining, and I'll see you all tomorrow, hopefully, and in the New Tactics website. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.